So my name is Francisco Veloso and I'm the Dean at uh, Imperial College Business School. And uh, as the Dean, I mostly oversee the team, um, looking at more the strategic level of what the school does and, and working with the, with the rest of the fantastic team to materialize uh, you know, the vision, the ambition of the school and what we're trying to build here. Cool. And when this interview goes out, you'll have been here just shy of a year. So what attracted you to, to, to move to London and to, to take this role? Well, it's always a combination of things that, that make you, um, uh, you know, go on a path such as this, and this was certainly the case. Uh, and I would say that one of the things that really attracted me is the, the trajectory that the school is. So what happens is that, you know, the business dynamics here at Imperial College is has been relatively recent in the grand scheme of things, let's put it this way, of business schools. And what I felt is that what's happening here at the business school is rather unique because what you have is a combination of very strong areas, um, academic areas, the way we think about a business school, say finance or marketing or innovation entrepreneurship, to name a few, um, and the, the development of, of those, but also that coupled with the dynamics that it allows to explore things such as entrepreneurship, um, digitization, uh, technological disruption inside the business school, but also in connection to the rest of the uh, Imperial College uh, London. And that is really something that's very unique today. Very few business schools, I think, can really work in this space the way that I think that the uh, business school uh, here at Imperial College can do. Um, and then certainly other, you know, complementary elements, you know, the reputation and the brand uh, of Imperial College London, London itself, the city and, and all that it has to offer with its very dynamic business environment. So it's a little bit all of these combinations. And then also the fact that it relates well to my own personal uh, uh, experience, right? I mean, I, I was trained as an engineer, then got interested in innovation entrepreneurship. I've been in the US and Europe across engineering and business schools and so I really felt that the whole thing kind of came together very nicely in terms of um, uh, you know next career step uh, for me and, and for the school of course I mean, it's a two-way process of selection in some senses. <laughs> Lots of stuff there that I'm going to have to pick up on later but I think it's really interesting that you, you mentioned about uh, London being di a dynamic city and, and, and lots going on here in terms of business. And I've seen that you've written some stuff about how in terms of business schools and business and education, London is still very much open in spite of Brexit. Now, you've worked, studied, taught all over the world. And in light of the sort of turmoil affecting, I guess, the UK around Brexit, why do you think that this is still a city and a school that international students would want to come and learn about business? Well... The core elements that I described about the business school, so the strength of the disciplinary areas, together with the possibility to work on these uh, very important topics of today, such as entrepreneurship, um, innovation, you know, uh, technological disruption, digitization, that doesn't go away with this turmoil that happens around it. In effect, even if you if one ponders around that, I mean, some of these very big disruptive forces around digitization may have a much bigger impact than Brexit altogether, right? And so, so I think some of the core fundamentals about what what it is possible to build here and at the business school um, really don't go away with the turmoil around it. I mean, is it a good thing what's happening around it in terms for the city and for the country? I don't think it is. I, I wish that there would be less of this turmoil. Uh, but I don't think it really affects the vision to really build a top uh, business school here in London that in connection with Imperial College can really tackle these very fundamental uh, issues that are at the core of what it is to be a manager today um, in this day and age. So on that note, I think that's, that's a really interesting point. And I mean, VUCA, um, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity has become very much a new normal. But... While it, it, it does cause a lot of disruption, it has, raised, um, it has raised the profile of really important business skills like agility, resilience, innovation. How do you think business skills are responding to prepare managers to, to thrive in a, in a sort of VUCA workplace, in a VUCA economy? How are we sort of um, building those sort of skills needed to, to lead and manage in today's world? That's a very interesting um, question. And 
as you can imagine, something that we grapple with um, on, on the way that we think about our own business school in important ways. And so I do think it is critical for the business schools to think about how, how they are preparing students. And I think there are very elements that I think the business schools need to take into consideration, and certainly that's the way that we are thinking about it. First is, is to reaffirm that you know, understanding marketing, understanding finance, understanding strategy is still very important in this volatile uh, environment. And so making sure that your core is there and that you're doing a good job on that is always needs to be there. So it cannot be done at the expense of that. Now, with that in mind, then we have to think about the changes that are going on. How do you prepare the students? And so one of the things that we've been very much pushing is this entrepreneurial mindset, this idea that if change is happening around you, either you can be on the passenger seat in some sense or on the driver's seat because it is taking place. And so what we try to instill in our students is this notion that if you're coming here, we're going to help you to prepare you to be on this driving seat, to be an agent of this change, and hopefully for good, obviously, right? But, but to be an agent, a protagonist of this change, be it in a new firm or an existing organization. So this, this is one important element. The other important element is a, a much greater familiarity in training in analytical skills, in being able to deal with data, understanding, you know, digitization, all of these elements that then branches out to other areas such as fintech, digital marketing, and all of these things that are important and around which we have a variety of, um, of initiatives that are all uh, very important here. The third element related to that is also what, was, what I would say um, in relation to the other part, which are the soft skills, right? So uh, we realize that uh, the creativity, the working in teams in a more robotized environment is gaining a different stance. And so we need to prepare the students for that. And the last element that I want to, um, to note, because I think it really links several of these as a good example, is something that's more specific to our school, but I think it shows the kinds of things that schools can do is, for example, our emphasis in training students in design thinking. So why do we do that? I mean, we do that because if you're in this VUCA environment, over the next 10 years, you will be facing disruption. You will see parts of the business around you being dismantled and rebuilt in a different way. You will have to question some of the things that are at the core of the business model of the organization that you will be the design thinking is hopefully preparing our students to be comfortable in asking these questions, in having the tools to look for answers, and then to think about their implementation in a significant way. And this is for us you know, just an interesting example of how you can actually have a tangible way around your, the MBA skills to really prepare students for this novel and different present and certainly future. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's an interesting one because... You, you know, you have to strike the balance between soft and hard skills. And I think that at the same time, employers, they're not 100% sure what they're looking for. They don't, they don't quite yet know what they need for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that puts a massive challenge on business schools to think for today and for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So they're preparing these leaders of tomorrow. Um, do you think that schools are adequately responding to that challenge for the most part? I think they're trying. I mean, I think it's, it's hard to, um, to make it just a general evaluation. I think that when, when I go certainly to meetings with the other deans and, and other leaders of business schools, I think the leaders are very keenly aware that things are changing and that and they are doing things inside their own business schools to adapt to these, you know, how successful they're being on, on really being able to um, instill these types of skills into, into the students. It's still early to, to say, because I think everybody's kind of in transition at different speeds with, with different um, uh, levels of assertion, let's put it this way. But I think they're all trying to cater to this new reality um, and to prepare the students for the, for, for the new reality. I think some schools are probably more advanced, better equipped to do it than others, uh, which is normal. I, think, I believe really that we are on the better equipped side of things, but, uh, but obviously, you know, I'm, um, I'm biased in my own evaluation of my own school. But I think that, that brings us nicely to the, to the next point. I know that you're, you're very passionate about uh, the role of digital education and online learning, um, and I can see that you've, you've written and talked about that quite a lot. Now, there is, in, in, in our industry, in the, in the sort of business education industry, there's, there's very much the school of thought that we're preparing 
leaders and businesses to be innovative, but yet in many cases business schools are behind the curve. Now in terms of, I suppose, learning and teaching, how are you really sort of leading the way in, in innovation and, and, you know, really sort of being at the forefront of, of digital learning? Uh, that, that is very critical and, and, and indeed I agree with you that most business schools are probably behind what's happening on the businesses around them. And, uh, fortunately for us, we really, uh, and this comes before my time and so, you know, I take no credit for it, it's really, you know, something that the school has felt very, uh, very passionate about is that this was going to be very significant for the way that we learn. And so it has invested very significantly in creating capabilities. We have a fantastic uh, educational technology team and ed tech team that for several years has been very much working around how do we teach online? But how do we teach online in a very you know, rich way, engaging way? It's not about a MOOC, it's not about a video. On the contrary, it's really about creating an interactive learning environment that's digitally mediated and doing that. And so basically we invested on that for several times and we launched a very successful global online MBA. We adjusted our executive MBA as well so that it's a blended program because we feel that that's the reality of the executives today. That's the way we feel about it. But a very important thing around that and that touches on how we're learning about it is that on the one hand, we learn about that and bring those learnings into the forefront of what we offer uh, inside you know, the school in different ways so that we, the things that we learn that we can do better because of this digital platform, we bring this even to the classroom that's happening here. So obviously the, the most well known is what we think about flipping the classroom and these kinds of things, but it's more about the interaction. How do you get that interaction with the students through a digital platform? and really increase the learning around that. And then also about measurement, right? I mean, you have better data about what the students do and don't do, and then you can relate that to how they have accomplishments. All of that is an important part of this learning process. And we take it very, very serious because it is really the present and certainly, and certainly the future. Right. <laughs> I think that, you know, in terms of where it all fits together, you know, you've got the the sort of challenge to create leaders as much as managers and what's what we're seeing emerging across MBA programs is you know people are coming out with you know fully rounded skill sets so they've got this data they've got analytics they've got project management but what's really tying MBAs together and differentiating them from perhaps other managers is that they, they're bringing this sort of ethical leadership, responsible management, and they're really sort of changing the way that the MBA graduate has been positioned in the past. Um, we're finding our research is increasingly showing that MBAs really care about sustainability and they want to actually be world leaders and make a difference, as well as business leaders who are generating profit. profit. So it's sort of people, purpose, profit is what we're seeing more coming across. Do you think that the business school has a responsibility to, to really sort of champion the sustainability and ethical agenda and nurture that sort of, I guess, love for ethics and sustainability in their students? Or do you think that's something that should be developed more from within? I really think that, um, that the business school has the responsibility to develop um, you know, ethical and responsible leaders. I mean, we are talking about training leaders, preparing people to be leaders of tomorrow. And if these are elements that we think are important for our future, for our common future, then we need to be having that very present on the way that we educate and that we prepare these leaders. So, and this cuts across, right? I mean, when we're talking about, for example, entrepreneurship is about social entrepreneurship as well and, and having that social dimension as, as well as the profit. It doesn't have to be just on the profit side. It has to be to do with the ethical um, uh, dimension that you, that you noted uh, as well. But as you, as, you, as you also alluded to, there's a very interesting and growing um, concern uh, around climate change and sustainability that I think is also at the core of what um, you know, a student um, that is coming through an MBA uh, cares for. And interestingly, this is becoming more mainstream. I mean, these topics like green finance, for example, is something that for our business school, we have even a center around you know, climate change and finance, because we really think how important that is for what we do. And so this is an area that as a business school, in fact, uh, more broadly as a college, we, we take very seriously. It's one of the areas 
that the institute has created one of these, what, what it's termed a global institute. So these are institutes that cut across the various faculties to address a pressing societal issue, in this case, climate change. So we are very much present and active in, in, in that space. We have even a master dedicated to that, to that area. But importantly for the MBA, that percolates very importantly to the offering that the students have um, uh, available. And so we do have you know, a, a, a couple of courses that are all around sustainability issues, one in clean technology and the other one in, in climate um, uh, in sustainability and climate change that are part of the curriculum offered so that the students can have uh, that understanding, but beyond that, we provide the students with the tools to get more engaged, right? Because there will be talks, there will be seminars, there will be other students that are working on this, and so uh, it creates a level of depth that the students can further explore um, and get to know better uh, beyond, you know, the coursework and the individual assignments or projects that it will have as part of the core course, so that this is not thought out just as a course that you do, but rather an agenda that is present, and that should be part of what the students uh, that are doing an MBA, you know, care for and, and very much have, have present in their in their in their education. Yeah, see, I think I think that's really exciting because I think you know it's it's about it's about a red thread really that that connects through everything. That you're not looking at fintech as fintech, you're looking at fintech and how can that be connected to climate change sustainability and bringing it all together so as they've got that mindset from the offset. Yes, and, and for example, this is, is also an interesting example in that regard because we, we have a very strong finance group and finance area, which is you know, going uh, back to the, the discussion we had about being a core area of a business school finance. It's very strong in, in, our, um, in our school. And then we have a very strong area of sustainability. You cross the two and you create a center in climate change and finance that then hosts a variety of professors' initiatives that then you can serve the broader school, uh, but certainly, you know, and in a very particular way, the, uh, the MBA and the, and the education and the, and the training of, that we're providing to the MBA students. Okay, so we've talked about quite a lot of sort of, you know, factors that are impacting on, on business schools, ranging from sustainability, geopolitics, VUCA, innovation, and the need for more innovation. If you had to sort of summarize the biggest challenge facing fellow deans today, um, <laughs> how would you start to define that? <laughs> um, I think I would say that there are, you know, two or three uh, challenge. One is certainly around the issue that of this role of business school. So as we think about ethics, as we think about the future of work, uh, as we think about climate change, it's clear that these are very big issues, very big problems that the business schools can't all tackle all of these, right? So they will be important to identify which we can contribute to if we want to have this perspective to be a meaningful business school that has an, an impact both from the point of view of the intellectual standing, meaning a better understanding of the phenomena, the issues, the challenges, and at the same time preparing the students for that, uh, for that future. So that, that is, I think, an important part, which is identifying, okay, what are the areas that we really want to be contributing to, and then building the skill set among the faculty, the collaborations, the networks that you can really have an impact on that uh, on that regard. So that's certainly one, one element. The other element is really about finding these, this balance between the virtual, the physical, the digital world, even in our own education. So one of the things that I believe has changed very dramatically is if you go back to the business school, say, 20 years ago, it was probably the MBA plus just you know, some degree of executive education. Now you have certainly undergraduates, graduate pre-experience, post-experience, blended programs, executive masters. So the whole landscape is becoming much more diverse. Um, and so finding the right balance of the product portfolio uh, is very, very critical for the identity and the, and the evolution of a business school with the added complexity that that portfolio will have also a physical and a virtual or you know blended component into it and so working around the boundaries and defining the boundaries of the space where the business school uh, are, are going to be 
is, is, is an important challenge. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of trial and error uh, over the next few years to try to identify. And we can see, you know, schools experiment with very many different, um, uh, you know, configurations um, around, around that. The other aspect that I think is very critical is diversity. And in particular, uh, I think the role of women in leadership. I think that uh, there's a, there has been over the last few years, and appropriately so, an important push to have more women on boards, more women in leadership positions. I mean, at the business school, we're training the next you know, generation of leaders. And so this concern with diversity uh, gender, but otherwise as well, needs to be very present in the decisions that we make about the class composition, the faculty composition, the role models that we create. And so making sure that that is something that the business schools are really contributing to is very critical. And this is one area that, that, that the business school would take um, uh, very seriously, you know, with our involvement and recognition as part of the Athena Swan um, uh, uh, you know, uh, effort that uh, that we really um, that is really important for us, and I think it's it's something that I think has to um, uh, be part of the present and, and the future. And we have you know from scholarships, uh, forte fellowships, and others that we have to really uh, foster and develop these these elements, which is which is uh, I think quite uh, quite important. I think the last element that I wanted to also highlight has to do with how to continue to attract, retain, and develop outstanding faculty in this environment. Because faculty tend to operate on their disciplinary grounds. And so here I am talking about the importance of having an impact, uh, tackling global challenges, understanding digitization, and the way that we still think on academic areas in general, and the way that faculty get trained is because they're faculty in economics in finance, in marketing, in innovation, right? And so finding a way to nurture these deep, this deep knowledge, which is very important because that there's a set of toolkits and knowledge that is important for them to be at the forefront of knowledge of, of a specific area. But then finding a way to link that to these broader issues, is, it is very, very difficult to do. Uh, and I think this is something that all the business schools um, are, are, are grappling with uh, and trying different ways to, uh, to, make that, to make that happen. Yeah. I mean, I think I love that answer. I, th I was nearly finished the interview, but now you've given me about four or five more questions to ask. I think that, you know, in terms of what you said about, um, I guess, the, the breadth of, of different courses and expansion of the, the sort of business school portfolio was really interesting. And depending on what newspaper you read on what particular day, you know, the MBA is diminishing, the MBA is growing in importance. What do you think its position is within the business school? Now, you know, some people would say, well, the MBA is our flagship course, whereas others would say, well, it's our loss leader. How do you think it, it, it is positioned within the, the business school? Is it, you know, is it the sort of still the core part of the business programs or has it got a new role and will that change in the future? Um, I think the, the, the MBA plays a very important role because of the role that it plays in, uh, you know, relaunching people's career paths in particular, right? I mean, so there's a variety of other products that are equally important for a business school. So I think what has changed is that before, I think you'd say that the MBA is the flagship program and it's around which a lot of the things in the business school get centered. I don't think that that's true anymore but it's not in a way that it says, oh, the, the MBA is, is not important, uh, uh, not at all. It's more about the fact that the business schools now you know, are active in several different uh, educational uh, spaces. But what I think is rather unique about the MBA and will continue is that it is this program by which you take people from a variety of different backgrounds that had started in some kind of role and then use the MBA to really you know, relaunch their career on a direction that around which they have a much better sense of what they want to do, right? I mean, so you may finish um, uh, undergraduate, or even if you did a pre-experienced master's, you may start to work uh, over the first few years, you're kind of discovering what you like, what you're good at doing, what it is, this thing to build a career, right? Which is in some sense something that at the beginning may be much more abstract. 
But I think that the moment you decide to do an MBA is typically the moment that, you know, okay, I kind of have a sense of where I want to go. I understand why the MBA can be a very important uh, lever into that um, advancement of my career. And so I go and, and go and do, and do an MBA. And there's no other product like that. I mean, you cannot replace the role of this product. And so you can have a discussion about, although is the market bigger, is the market smaller, is the market shrinking, is the market growing? Is it, uh, you know, a little bit older, a little bit younger? But this role is not going to go away. And so it will continue to be a centrally important product on the portfolio of a top business school internationally because this is... If we're talking about training leaders and contributing to leaders, you have to be contributing to this group of people that are people that are being prepared to be leaders, have that ambition, have that drive, have that capability, and therefore you are having that contribution. Now, you're going to contribute in different ways. You know, in our business school, we like to contribute a lot through the entrepreneurial mindset, through the linking to technology, to innovation, uh, to digital because that's what I think we're particularly equipped to train uh, these leaders to be able to do around that. Uh, and so their different MBAs will be able to contribute differently on this advancement. Um, and um, and we'll, you know, we'll be doing our own path and others will be doing others. But, but, but I think it, it is and will be you know, uh, still a very central product in this, in this regard. Couldn't agree more. And then I think it's really interesting in terms of, I suppose, cohort diversity. And I think that a challenge that, that more and more business schools are facing are, you know, you're right, um, diversity of men and women, but also diversity of experience. So, you know, people bringing in creative backgrounds or entrepreneurial backgrounds, science backgrounds. I mean, the cohort learn as much from each other as they do from faculty in many cases. How do you sort of perfect the, the ideal diverse cohort? How do, you, how do you start to think about recruiting them? It's, uh, it's, it's very, you know, it, it is hard. I mean, it's, it's as much as, a, a, as an art as a science. Um, I mean, I think one of the elements about becoming a science is precisely that as we have more sophisticated analytical tools, we can start to have a, a better analytical grasp on that, uh, on that element. And I think it is very important that we start to be more analytical also about that, about what is the composition. And this is certainly something that I, I think the business schools need to consider uh, much more, including, including ourselves. We're, we're having discussions on how do we have a, a more structured analytical approach to, to, to it. But, um, and the reason is because I think that in some senses you have to uh, balance many, many different variables, right? And so what I think people generally value, and, and this is what I think we, we can do, is in some senses a balance. What I mean about this is the following. People also come to MBAs because they find some identity about the MBA, about something you know, more or less uh, that they find that differentiates it from other MBAs, right? And so when, we th when I think about that, it's hard for me to think in abstract. I think it has to do with what is the kind of diversity that you're trying to build given the profile of your, of your MBA, right? And so in my, if I would think about our case, right, where we're trying to have this entrepreneurial dimension, it is very critical that we have a set of entrepreneurs that come because they'll bring, bring that drive and that experience, right? Uh, it is very important that we bring people that are comfortable in several areas of science and technology if we're able to connect to that. Um, but at the same time, we don't want people to think that the Imperial um, College Business School MBA is just a you know, techie, geeky MBA. And so you need to balance that with people that are coming from the arts, from the design maybe, um, you know, uh, from the creativity part so that you have a little bit of a, a, of a mix, right? So, so for me, for example, this type of mix and thinking along those lines of profiles and diversity of profiles may be more important than thinking about, oh, I want one from fast-moving fast consumer goods, another one from the financial industry, another one from consulting, another one from... So other, you know, may segment in a different way, right? So I think we want to create a certain environment and a certain experience for, for that class. And so for us, it's important to think about building the diversity around 
what we believe is important for our identity. And so if we want to connect to climate change and if we have somebody that um, uh, comes from that background, it's very nice to bring them to the program because they will bring that concern to the program and, and we want to have that. So, so that's the, the types of elements that we think about um, when we're considering the profile of the class that we want uh, to build. But it's, when you're trying to do that, there's always elements that are hard, but in some sense, there's also elements that bring some interesting novelty. For example, we've started a very successful global online MBA program uh, precisely because it built on the educational technology investment that we've done over the last few years. And one of the very interesting developments around that has been the growth on the presence of people that are coming out of regions like Africa and the Middle East. And it's interesting to understand why, right? I mean, I was just looking at the profile of a student that just started our recent more, uh, cohort, and he was handling very large infrastructures in Africa, right? If you're handling very large infrastructures in Africa, there's no way you can attend a regular MBA unless you decide to stop. So a global online MBA allows you to you know, look for that MBA education and still make it compatible with your career path that you're trying to achieve and to develop. So one of the very interesting um, uh, developments around this more blended uh, online solution is to bring other elements of diversity that are sometimes harder to weave into the MBA because you're thinking about it, for example, that you have to stop, come from a year, and with a variety of opportunity costs to make that decision. Now, these more blended you know, or online approach allow other new elements of diversity to be more present in the classroom, which is, which is very, very, very interesting and, and very, very enriching. Um, and this is part of the, the elements that we're learning about the potentials of having these novel approaches on the MBA at the MBA level. Fantastic. Okay, and then just to, towards the end of the interview, just to sort of, um, I suppose, closing the loop. Um, obviously, it's important to recruit and, and develop MBAs on the course, but a big part of the, the sort of, I guess, MBA journey is that relationship with employers and corporates. Um, I mean, I don't think that it would even be worth asking you why that's important, but how can a business school build ever stronger links with employers and, and really sort of, I guess, add their own insight to the business world? in terms of relationships and partnerships? I think that the relationship with the corporate world is ever more important. And I think more recently, you can even materialize in different ways. So what I mean about this is that we can look at that a traditional way, which is for recruitment purposes, right? So we have, we all have, you know, employers that we know our, our students would like to be employed and that like our students and we foster those relationships. And, and certainly at the Imperial College Business School, we. We do very much of that. That's not very different from all the other business schools that try to build that relationship. It is a very important relationship. But I think in this day and age, this relationship needs to be even more profound for, um, for some of the reasons that, uh, that have been discussed about what's happening in the world around. So what I mean about this is with the work and the future work of work having so many uncertainties because of technology, digitization, disruption, how we understand a job, a role, a function today is not the same that it's going to be in five years, in 10 years, it's going to change. And so the relationship with the employer should also be about, on both sides, understanding what are the things that the students are now looking for in an employer in this new day and age, right? What it is for them a wonderful development opportunity that they feel is going to allow them to progress in the future. And I think the, the employers are eager to know that about that. I mean, I had a, a, a lunch um, with a, a financial services uh, company a couple of weeks ago that invited me and a couple of other colleagues precisely because of that, because they were feeling that their communications with the prospective employees was complicated because they were looking for different things and having different expectations. So that is one element, that, that dialogue. We have to also foster that dialogue on both sides. That's one important element of that. The other very important element of that is actually to partner with some of these to learn more about what this future of work means. And while that may not be relevant for all the business schools, that's certainly very relevant for us. And for example, 
you know, we have a variety of partnerships in the area of, um, you know, consultancy and banking to look precisely how AI digitization is affecting jobs uh, in the future, say in a bank, for example, what's going to happen to, to these jobs, how they're going to evolve, how they're going to have to be reshaped because of, 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 the, of this transformation that's going on. So when you engage with these corporations that way in, in terms of research and understanding, it really has then a lot of important spillovers to better understanding the skill set, better understanding the relationship between the soft and the hard skills, better understanding what is the nature of jobs into the future and therefore how you train for them. And so it's very interesting because in some senses you have now more opportunities to deepen that relationship with the business schools and really be a partner in understanding these changes that are affecting everybody. It's affecting us as business schools, it's affecting the firms and affecting the students and future employees as they enter the workforce or we enter the workforce for most of the MBA students. Absolutely. And then just finally, um, I mean, th there's a lot of negative news in the business press all the time about, you know, robots taking our jobs, about VUCA, about volatility. Um, in light of all that and everything we've discussed, do you, do you feel optimistic about the future of business? <laughs> I am, uh, in, in general, maybe it's just personality, I'm a very optimistic uh, I'm feeling person. that, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's not to say that there's not going to be disruption, that there will be, and and in fact, I think uh, we all have responsibility and, and many of the disruptive firms, let's put it this way, have an important responsibility to help better understand how do we prepare some generation of people whose jobs are going to be affected to live in this new world. And so I'm saying this is a responsibility because a lot of this is going to be, you know, not people that are coming to do an undergraduate or even an MBA or even an executive MBA. There are people that are there out there on the workforce already. Uh, and so I think we need to have a better understanding of that. And I think the business schools can really play a role. The example that I told you about, for example, understanding how jobs are going to be affected in a, in a big bank because of digitization is one good example of that, is if we understand that better, we can help anticipate how those jobs are going to be affected and what can we do to retrain these people to reskill what kinds of competencies we may want to develop to mitigate some of the, uh, the negative effects, and what are the kinds of companies that we want to enhance to basically better work with the kinds of tools and solutions that are going to, are going to appear. So when I, when I say that I'm optimistic about the future and about what the technology can enable, um, is because I think a lot of it is going to be augmenting the work in important ways. But that is not to say that there's not going to be people that are going to be very negatively affected. I think there, there will be. And, you know, there's the, you know, very, you know, the stereotype um, example that people talk is the truck drivers in, you know, in the U.S. There are three million of them um, and that are going to be affected if all the trucks are automated. Of course, they will be affected. So we need to be proactively thinking about what are we going to do to find alternative jobs for these people. And I think is a responsibility for the business schools to be part of the research and the understanding and the anticipation of what can be done. But I think it is also part of responsibility of some of the large established businesses. Uh, you know, if you take, for example, the big five, you know, I think that the big five should be probably much more engaged with business schools on supporting research and work to try to better understand these trends and try to better understand what can be done to anticipate some of the um, of these changes, because what I feel is that some of the things that we're already starting to see, which is people sometimes rebelling against this big five, because they are the in some senses they incarnate this disruption. I mean, it's not that they're the only ones doing, and a lot of it is actually starting coming out of sometimes small firms, but they're the most visible, the most profitable ones, and so they become easy targets for these types of disruptions. I think. One um, step that I think that they could do is to engage more with, with universities and business schools in particular to try to better understand what's going with jobs, what's, what's understanding with skills and helping uh, uh, you know, identify what are the steps that we can all do to try to mitigate some of the negatives and, and basically augment and leverage the, the positives that's coming uh, uh, out of this, uh, out of this uh, you know, technological innovation disruptions. So the, when, when we're talking about 
um, you know, the, the role that business schools can play also in, in contributing to society and, uh, and technological innovation in important ways. Another very good example is the area of healthcare. Um, you know, hospitals are undergoing massive, um, you know, transformation because of digitization, aging population, a lot of devices and the things that you can do at home. And there's two or three things that the business schools, like in other areas, can also contribute a lot, and that's true for our business schools. One is to understand better these pressures over the system and what can be done to better manage the system. And we have, uh, you know, a center in the area of healthcare that 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 is really very active, contributing to this uh, to this area. But then, even at the at the level of behavior, one of our faculty members was just now at the World Economic Forum, precisely presenting research related to a behavior and food consumption and obesity um, in important ways and what you can do to better tackle these types of situations given better understanding about people's uh, behaviors, right? So this is one interesting example of how a business school uh, on the behavioral side can contribute to elements also related to, to, to the medical dimension. Uh, in this case, was obesity, but it could be aging, it could be uh, lifestyles, it could be a variety of things. Organization of the, you know, in the UK would be NHS, but other parts of the world would be their own healthcare system. So healthcare is a very other important area where I think that uh, the business school uh, can play a very important role as interpreter, as a guider, as a, as a research tool to better understand, anticipate, help change in significant ways. And then, of course, with important links to the education part because you can make that part of the curriculum that you offer. Uh, healthcare is a you know, gigantic sector that takes a lot of people on the managerial side as well. And so training people to be active on that space and, and well-trained so that they can be agents of change again, I think can be really, really uh, powerful. And I just wanted to you know, complement that with, with that, that note on the health side.